Mesdames et messieurs, honorables invités, bonjour. It's really a pleasure to be with you today. You know, when Mercy talked to me about uh, the World uh, NGO Day, I said, wow, this is a very important initiative. I must um, support it. And we discussed about the process. In fact, Monsieur Eric Falk just talked to you about the process that we have to go through. You know, this gentleman is really audacious. And uh, today, this first happening is just wonderful. And the minister talked about Monsieur Marty Artisari. He's a friend of mine. <laughs> I met his wife here in Helsinki in the 1990s when I was minister and uh, mobilizing funds for my government for education and for Nepal. And we sold soup in uh, the market. Isn't that wonderful? And in 2007, I met Monsieur Marty Artisari, the president, former president, and he became a friend of mine. We meet three times a year. So it's great to be in Helsinki. Beautiful country, wonderful people. Now, talking about NGOs, you have seen that I have been minister, okay, government. I have worked in UNESCO. I have even been ADG of education. And when I was called again to be minister, I thought three times, I said, oh, the independence of NGOs is so great that I think I should stay with the NGOs. So celebrating this day today with you is just great. Well, the liaison committee of UNESCO has been elected two years ago, and we are nine members coming from all around the world. We work in the field of uh, UNESCO's program at the national, regional, and international level. And today we are also involved in shaping the post-25 framework. And believe me, we call for partnership between NGOs, civil society, governments, UN system organizations, and the private sector. Together, they will be able to not only give the last push for the education for all by 2015, but, uh, you know, work on a sustainable development for all for the post-2015. Uh, now, they, I have been as we talk about uh, where we stand as far as education for all is concerned, the progress made, but what is left? And I'm going to use the Global Monetary Report, the 2013 Global Monetary Report, as far as the facts and figures are concerned. Well, since 2000, there has been a lot of progress, but there is a lot of work to be done. And uh, not a single goal will be achieved globally because many countries are still lagging behind. Let's start by the first goal, which is early childhood care and education. Well, only 48% of countries will meet this goal. In 2012, we still had 6.6 6 million child that were dying before the age of five. 162 million were, you know, they, they, they were malnourished. And 20% were hunted. And we know, and I'm going to quote it, early childhood care education services help build skills at a time when children's brains are developing. As far as pre-primary education is concerned, well, the infrastructure in developing countries, you know, are, are uh, given by private providers. What does it mean that poor children will not have access? And this is going to contribute to inequity in access at this level. And also, in 2000, there was no target, a clear target for this level. 
Therefore, we could not track the progress made. Therefore, for the post-2015, there must provide a clear target to track the progress so that not a single child will be left, you know, on the road. Let's move to goal two, which is universal primary education. Well, only 56% of countries will reach this goal by 2015. And you all know that in 2011, we still had 57 million kids that were out of school. 54% were girls. And uh, in Africa, for instance, 22% of children are out of school. And this is really terrible because I belong to that continent, as you, as you might see. What is important also is uh, to know that 50% of the out-of-school kids live in uh, countries where you have uh, conflict, and 55% are girls. The discrimina discrimination is most of the time, especially in Africa, it's against girls. Let's move to goal three. This is a goal which has been really neglected. It's youth and adult skills. Only 46% of countries will reach this goal. In fact, it is a secondary education. And uh, in 2000, there was no target to track the progress. Therefore, for the post-2015, we have to have clear target, clear indicators, so that we will be able to track the progress. Only 37% of kids were completing lower secondary. And in, in Africa, if these, these trends continue, it is said in the Global Monitor Report that uh, in 2011, the boys will be able to reach. But for the girls, it's going to be 64 years later. Can you imagine? And today, we have 69 million young people out of school. And you know what it means. If we do not take care of them, they will take care of us. That's the problem. Let's move to the adult literacy. This is the goal which has not been progressing at all. In fact, in 2015, only 29% of countries will reach universal literacy. The number of illiterate people is 774 million people, 62% being women. And uh, in Africa, it's 182 million people. Two-thirds, again, are women. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the most uh, difficult thing to, 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 to see. As far as quality is concerned, we know that children are not really learning. Because uh, among the 650 children of school age, you have uh, 130 million that have reached fourth grade and they do not have to read and write. In fact, in, in developed countries, rich countries, we still have 160 million people that cannot fill a form. Can you imagine? For us, when I heard it, I just couldn't believe it until I met a lady, a beautiful young woman, a blonde in Geneva. She could not find the wagon where she was going to, to go into because we were going to Paris. She looked at everybody and then came to me and said, could you tell me where I should uh, you know, step in to go to Paris? And I found out that she could not read the numbers. And I told her, let, let me allow, let, let me, let, let's go together. So I helped her get into her wagon and then got back. And that really struck me. And I understood that there is a, you know, literacy, when you have it, it's a dignity. And she didn't want people to know that she did not know how to read and write. Anyway, in Sub-Saharan Africa, 
in 2015, there still will be 26 million illiterate that will be living. The 26 percent illiterate people of the whole world will be living in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, gender, parity, and equality. As far as parity is concerned, it's almost all right. But equality is really what we call a mirage. Only 70 percent of countries will reach gender parity at primary education by 2015. And only 56 percent of countries will reach lower secondary education by 2015. Well, in general, the disparity, especially in developing countries, it's really against girls. Now, as far as quality is concerned, as I said before, 650 million of school age, they are not really learning. And uh, teachers are key to quality education. And when you look at sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, the ratio teacher uh, pupils, it's 40 to 1. How can he be able to animate the classroom? How can really the children be able to really learn? That's a big challenge. And uh, most of the teachers are not well trained, if trained at all. Sometimes they are taken from other sectors to come and teach. Can you imagine? It's a profession. You have to learn. Pre-service, in-service, it's very key. And in fact, in-service training is uh, much more uh, difficult than pre-service training in sub-Saharan Africa. Of, in, in Africa, for instance, allow me, I mean, I'm sorry, I have to talk about sub-Saharan Africa, because that's where the challenge is really. When you have female teachers, it promotes girls' education, yet they are very few. What about the learning materials? They have to be of quality, where the females, girls, women and girls are portrayed in a, a better way. But most of the time, that, not does, that doesn't happen. The doctor will always be a man, and the nurse will always be a woman. And, the, and uh, when you go to a, a service, the senior people, it's always men. And the, the secretary, assistants, and whatever, it's always girls. So the images of women and girls is not portrayed in a, in a, a good way. In, in developing countries where the working language most of the time is not the language of the child, so the means of instruction, for instance, in Guinea, it's French. So when the child comes to class, he has a lot of knowledge already. But when he comes in the classroom, he has to start all over again. It's as if he doesn't know anything. It's a shock. So we have to find a way of dealing with this issue. Mother tongues are very important to start with and then introduce foreign languages. It's very good for the quality of education for the child later. Now, the, co the environment should be conducive to learning. When you talk about the environment, you have to think about health. Some kids are not healthy. In Africa, malaria is killing more than HIV and AIDS. And AIDS. And uh, you have to talk about, uh, you know, um, nutrition. When the child is not well fed, how can he concentrate or she? Therefore, one meal a day is very important for the child. And um, it's amazing. We found out that uh, some girls would just leave school because of lack of uh, sanitary um, nap Nap napkins, I don't know how to call it in English. Forget my English anyway. And also, there is a lot of violence now at school. How to deal with that violence? And it's all around the world. Today, this is the question which we are dealing with in Europe and in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. Violence at school. 
especially gender violence. It's terrible. If you do not uh, cut it out, kids will not be learning. Some will be dropping out. Well, what else should I add to that? It's a research. To find out why children are not learning, it's important to undertake research. Because uh, you have hidden, hidden uh, challenges. It's only by research that we can find it out and fill in the gap. Now financing for education for all. This is a big issue. Why? Because countries are not really uh, putting enough money to the education sector. But donors either have not um, committed, have not uh, respected the, commi the, the um, commitment they made in Dakar. You know, they said that not a single country committed in uh, uh, working in the field of education for all will suffer from lack of funds, and yet it has not happened. Uh, it has dropped. The aid has been dropping. And uh, in fact, some donors are really shifting from the education sector to food security. And I tell them, food security, yes, it's very good. However, if you give to the farmer a machine to deal with his uh, agriculture, he doesn't know how to, he doesn't know off and on. Will he be able to use it? One. Two. If he doesn't know the instruction, can he use it? So really, education is very important. It's, it's transversal. It, it's really the, the key to all development uh, uh, targets. NGOs are not, not NGOs. It's private sector and foundations. Their contribution, to, it has been only 5%. Now, what is the need for basic education? It's around 16 billion. It's very easy to find it out. You know, that some people are talking about uh, ice cream in the US or lipsticks in Europe. If you cut it down and put it into education, that might fill in the gap. Don't think that it's not because I'm not putting any lipstick. Yeah? And for the secondary, it's um, 8 billion which is needed. What is the role of private sector, what they, can they play? Because we know that governments cannot by themselves meet education for all throughout life. They have to partner with uh, civil society organizations, with multi and bilaterals, with the private sector. You know private sector had not been invited in Dakar in 2000. That was a big mistake. So they were invited, I think, UNESCO invited them when the, the high-level group was uh, met in, in Brazil. I think it was around 1994. Mr. Eric Falk can tell us the year. So, what can the private sector do? And I said they, can, they could maybe set up financial support to education for all. They can ex expand their uh, skills, their own skill development programs to reach the kids, the young people that are needy, disadvantaged young people. Work together with the universities, indicating to the university the kind of skills they need so that these universities will review their uh, programs, their curriculum, work with the students so that uh, the, their orientation will be well done, so that at the end of their training, they will be able to find easily a job. They could also align support with national government priorities, including through training uh, funds. Why not give grants to NGOs working in the field of education, finance research through universities, to identify, as I said before, why children are not really learning and how to fill in the gap, they could also give scholarship to needy children. As for NGOs, what kind of role? You know, NGOs are the ones that give voice to the voiceless. They are the ones who are bringing the voices of the grassroots people, bringing up front 
the challenges that they are they have well they are the, therefore the ones that are able to reach the very difficult children in particular those belonging to poor families rural areas minority ethnic groups most of the time they develop innovations that aim to provide greater educational opportunities to the children I just mentioned. And they come up with uh, best practices that can influence government to review and reform policies in order to accelerate the progress in education for all. And I always say throughout life, it has to start with, with early childhood education, but it has to go up to the higher education, primary, secondary, technical, and vocational. And not a single child should be left aside. I will talk about FAWI later because I will be in the panel. And I thank you very much.